welcome to Mind Boggles. Today we're going to talk about power thinking. You're going, oh goodness, power thinking? What's power thinking? Well, um, from my earlier history uh, with hypnosis and hypnotherapy and professional baseball and all this kind of stuff, you learn things about positive thinking that is helpful. Later on you learn about the dynamics of thinking, eventually the technology of thinking. So today we're going to talk about the technology of how you can use your mind to accomplish things. Pretty straightforward, because we realize if I think bad, I tend to live bad. If I can think better, I tend to live better. That's fair enough, isn't it? Well, is there ways to think that could be creatively powerful as opposed to uncreatively um, weak? For example, you ever notice when you, when you lay down on the couch after a hard day at work, and you think about how lousy things have been, or you're, you're behind your car payments, or you start thinking about all these dismal things, it seems like you're just absolutely fatigued, right? Completely out of energy. It drains you. But someone walks in the door and says, hey, Helen, let's go bowling. And you love to bowl. All of a sudden, bam, up you go. You can't wait to get to the, to the bowling alley. Things that bring us joy tend to raise our energy level. Things that suck energy out of us tend to draw us down to be very fatiguing. So the idea is, how can I use my mind more constructively? How can I design it to where I can have the energy coming in to lift my game? Well, I found this out uh, uh, kind of uh, by accident when I was in college. I was a baseball player. And I was a catcher at USC, Southern Cal. And my junior had a very terrible season. I was trying harder and harder, and the harder I tried, the worse I got. You know, people don't realize what that's like when you put pressure on yourself to hit or pressure on yourself to bowl. You tend to get worse when you start thinking about it. So I wound up get, went to the hospital with the chicken pox, of all things. So I'm confined for a week in the hospital there on campus. Meanwhile, that weekend we're playing UCLA for the championship, and I'm the catcher, and I'm in the hospital. So I remembered a story earlier that semester about a Russian ballerina at the turn of the century, like 1900, not 2000, but the 1900. She was hospitalized, told she would never dance again. Her career is over. And she said, I will dance again. So at the hospital, she practiced dancing in her mind. Three years later, she came out a greater dancer than when she went in the hospital. Right? So that's a good story. I don't know if it's true, but that's what I heard. So I'm in the hospital. I thought, well, I'm going to practice hitting. So I had the chance to practice without the pressure. I knew how to do things so I could stand there and visualize the ball and visualize sliders, curveballs, so forth, and started practicing mentally the, the skills of hitting a baseball. Came out and hit a bunch of home runs. We wound up winning the, the NCAA that year at the College World Series. Hit a bunch of home runs there. The point I'm trying to make here is I didn't get any smarter. I didn't get any stronger. I just had a chance to back off from the pressure and mentally organize my thoughts for the perfect swing or the perfect way to play the violin or the, the perfect um, uh, bowling to a strike or whatever it is. You could go back and rehearse it perfectly to kind of lock that into your nervous system. The idea that we kind of generally think is that practice makes perfect, not true. It's perfect practice makes perfect. So you're better off practicing the perfect move four or five times than practicing 100 times just being out there and practice. So perfect practice makes perfect. Right? So the idea here is how can I begin to use powerful thoughts to create a result that I'm looking for? Well. The technical part of this is realizing I can create and value for things and uh, uncreate value for things. Like as a baseball player professionally for about seven years, baseball was life and death to me for me when in my 20s and 30s. Today, it's not important at all, uh, actually. Other things have taken its place. It doesn't mean the baseball changed. My value for it changed. Uh, Maybe a more specific example. Um, my wife, Sheila Hollowell, worked the Columbine recovery. And the stress from working with people like that 
really affected her nervous system and she was, got quite ill and that's one of the reasons we left Colorado to come to Florida. We had to get off the 5,000 foot mountains and come back to sea level so she could breathe again. Stress of that. So we got really tuned in to how caregiving, how counseling, how working with people, you can create compassion fatigue where you feel so bad about things for your client, you wind up getting sick. Now there's actually a phrase called compassion fatigue. Well, Sheila and I did compassion fatigue seminars for AIDS caseworkers in Lauderdale. One day, we were getting ready to go to the seminar, and we were running a little bit behind. I like to be early to, to classes so I can prepare and be ready to go. Well, we we're running about on time, and the bridge came up there in Lauderdale. So now we're definitely going to be late. So we got 30, 40, 50 people waiting for us, and we're on this, behind this drawbridge. So I have the chance, an opportunity there, to sit in the car and be completely, totally stressed. Or I can realize all of the events in my life have no particular value. I can choose to place the value on it that I want. Right? So at this point, I realize, how can I enjoy being late? Right? Let me see what, how people treat me being late and see if I can find who are my good friends who aren't. Right? So let me enjoy being late today. Right? Now, for me, that's a huge 180. But the awareness here is, and I'm not any smarter than anybody else, but the awareness that you know, these values we have for things aren't set in stone. We can change the values of things. So let me enjoy being late. Well, the technical part of it, when you get, get down into the mechanics of consciousness, you think about, well, I'm creating stress by seeing pictures in my mind of disaster. I'm creating stress by talking to myself about how bad it's going to be. Uh, is there a way that I can use the techniques and uh, the technical part of consciousness to create power? Well, one thing would be to magnify your, your um, internal view of yourself doing something great. Like if you're afraid to uh, be on stage, well, see yourself on stage doing the perfect piano recital, whatever it happens to be, and have a spotlight on yourself, just bright white spotlight, bam, and hearing people going up and applause, you know, and you practice that. Yeah. Uh, other things would be zooming in and out. Now for me, uh, zooming in and out is a very powerful way to magnify feelings. For example, right now you're, in your tele you're watching television in your living room, and let's say I have a chocolate chip cookie on my hand here. You think, well, that's it. Okay, it has a chocolate chip cookie. But now, in your mind, visualize where your nose is about one foot from the chocolate chip cookie. Can you feel the energy go up? Right? So zooming in will increase energy. Zooming out tends to decrease energy. So if you have an issue that you're thinking about in your mind that's causing trouble like jealousy or anger or you're mad about somebody, imagine that person zoom, 100 yards away so the picture is about the size of a postage stamp. You feel the energy just disappear. You know? On the other hand, you have a feeling that you like, that you want. Um, um, imagine that, that image coming closer to you and you can feel the love or compassion or whatever you're shooting for, it go up. Right? Feel coming in, going out, increases the emotion or decreases the emotion. Another thing would be, if you, if you don't think of pictures, maybe you think of words. Like you talk to yourself all day about, oh my God, how bad it's going to be, it's going to be terrible, and you have this little voice going on. You realize, wow, uh, I talk myself into depression. <laughs> I talk myself into anger. How can they treat me this way? You know? Well. One way to do this is realizing, oh, I create these feel I create these feelings. It's not out in the world. I do it. In my mind, I create the anxiety, I create the jealousy, I create the anger. It's not out there. It's me. So, how can I uncreate it and create something different? Well, one thing would be if you realize that your voice causing the trouble, start talking slower. But Easy. Back off. Hey, take a deep breath. Slow your breathing. Relax a little bit. It's okay. You talk to yourself slower. 
Or maybe you have a, a, a someone else's voice who you truly, truly respect, your, your grandmother or a good friend or a coach. You hear that person's voice saying, Fred, assume your name is Fred, you know, hang in there. You can do this. It's okay. It's okay. You're going to be all right here. So you can use voices or feelings or pictures, but when you realize I create the anxiety and tension, how can I create something different? How can I develop a powerful thought, right? For example, success in your life is, would be a classic thing. Well, first, we tend to use pictures, words, and feelings. Those three things are the, the uh, vocabulary of powerful success and dismal failure. So how can I use, we don't tend to use smell and taste very much, but usually words, pictures, and feelings are the key. So let's say we're shooting for success. So you think, well, first of all, I gotta figure out what, what do I want? That's the tough question, but let's say you wanna be, you wanna own, own a tire store. Well, you see that picture of yourself owning the tire business. You see the picture, right? So you've got the picture, got it. Okay, the next thing is a multiple of what you say to yourself. Now, if you say to yourself, I can do this, or I can never do this, or I'm, I'm too tall, or I don't have the money, or the bank won't do it, da -da. if you talk yourself out of it, you weaken your, your power. So you've got to get your mind with the picture, your mind with the words. I can do this. I can absolutely make this happen. Then another multiple is feelings. You have to have the passion the dy dynamic drive to make things happen, as opposed to someone who said, gosh, it'd be nice to own a tire store, and yeah, I think I can talk about it, but I have no drive, I have no follow through, I don't make things happen, I don't stay the course. Well, it doesn't happen. So all three of these things, you have the, the internal picture that's clear, you have the dialogue about yourself, I can make this happen, you have the passion, doggone it, I'm going to make this thing happen, and you have the passion to make it happen. The results tend to take care of themselves. Now, when we're missing one of those three things, words, pictures, feelings, we reduce the power. Take two of them out, you reduce it dramatically. Right? So the idea of power thinking is how can I get a clear picture, how can I talk to myself about it, and how do I take action and make things work? Right? That's power thinking. It's not magic. It's just the nature of how our mind works, how consciousness works. So if you're missing one of those things, you might think, well, today, what do I want? You know, and once you have that answer, which is a tough one to come up with, see if you get a clear picture of it. And notice what, you, what do you say about it to yourself. You know? Notice your dialogue. You know? Maybe you've got to design new phrases to use. Uh, and notice if you have the... the, the, the the drive to make things happen, to take steps, to, to do action, to move, to make things work. And then you develop some power thinking. Anyway, just a thought. Uh, mind boggles. Hope you enjoyed today on power thinking. Uh, today, do something good for yourself, and if you have a chance, do something good for somebody else too. Until next time, see you later.